Viewers, welcome to this lecture on the major parts of a research paper. Basically, the purpose of this uh, video is for you to be able to understand the different major parts of a research paper, which includes the problem and its background, theoretical background and literature review, materials and methods, results and discussion, and finally, summary conclusion and recommendation. So for us to be able to understand what are these different parts and what are the components that we can include in each of the different chapters of our research paper. Let us begin first with the problem and its background. So for the problem and its background, you can include there the background of the study, the statement of the problem, objectives of the study, significance of the study, scope and limitation of the study, definition of terms. So let us discuss each of these the background of the study. So the background of the study should provide an overview of the problem or issue that is to be addressed, including any relevant context or historical background. It should also highlight the significance and the importance of your study and its potential implication for the field that you are studying. And finally, the background of the study should introduce any relevant theoretical frameworks or prior research that informs the study. So a good background study should really uh, include results from previous research, what are the known facts about the topic, and also should include what are the things that are still unknown about the topic and how the researchers want to move the discussion on the topic forward. So that should be found in the background of the, of the study. So a good uh, researcher should read a lot of literature prior to writing the background of the study. Because when you read relevant literatures on the topic, you will be able to identify the research gaps as well as the, what's uh, the development on that field and what are the things that you can still do. And those are the things that you will put in your background of the study. The next part is the statement of the problem. So the statement of the problem should clearly and concisely outline the specific research questions or problems being addressed by the study. It should explain the rationale for the research and why it is important to investigate this problem. So that's why it's called statement of the problem. So additionally, the statement should define any key terms or concepts that are central to the research questions and clarify the scope of the study. So you can begin first with a statement of what is the ideal scenario, what is the actual scenario, and what is the consequence of that scenario. Say for example, the ideal scenario when it comes to healthcare. So what should be the best scenario when it comes to healthcare? So that's the ideal scenario. And secondly, you put in what's the reality about the healthcare? So what's really happening about the healthcare system? What are the pressing issues, concerns, problems in the reality of the healthcare system? And finally, what are the consequences brought by those realities? So that is a good statement of the problem. And then the objective of the study. So the objective of the study should outline the specific goals or aims of the research. So this objective should be clear, measurable, and achievable, and should directly relate to the research questions or problems that you outline at the statement of the problem. So that is why the, the objective of the study is really connected to the statement of the problem because this is where you put your goal in order to address or to uh, move forward in terms of the problem that you just discussed a while ago. So there should be a connection between the statement of the problem as well as the objective of the study. The objective should also be structured in a logical and coherent manner, building on each other to achieve the overall aim of the study. And finally, your objective should be realistic and should be feasible given the available resources and constraints. So for example, if your research will just be good for five months, you have also to think 
whether your objectives can be finished within that timeline given. And then we have the significance of the study. So for the significance of the study, you should explain there the potential importance and contribution of the research to the field or relevant stakeholders. So what do we mean by stakeholders? So these are the people who would be directly affected by your project or would directly benefit from your project. So these are the people, uh, your target audience or participants for this study. So what is the contribution of your research to them? This may also include identifying any gaps in the existing literature that the research seeks to address as well as potential practical or policy implications of the findings. So that's why there are some research that includes policymakers, government, workers, and their significance of the study. Additionally, the significance should also explain how the study may contribute to the broader societal or scientific goals and highlight the potential benefits of the research to relevant stakeholders or communities. So a good practice is to start first with specific group of people and then you go wider and wider to the greater community in writing the significance of the study. Scope and limitation of the study. So there's also some uh, misconception on what's the difference between the scope and what is the limitation of the study. So basically the scope of the study is just an outline of the specific boundaries or parameters of the research, which could include the population or sample being studied, the geographical or temporal scope, and any specific variables or measures being used. So this should help you to clarify what the study is and what is not being investigated by the study. On the other hand, the limitation of the study should identify any potential weakness or shortcomings of the research, such as sample size limitation, methodolo methodological limitations, or data availability issues. So these are the things that could be a potential weakness or shortcomings of the research. So this can help also to contextualize the findings and provide important caveats to, to rule no, to the interpretation of the results. And finally, your limitations should also suggest areas for future research and potential improvements to the study design. And finally, the definition of terms for the chapter one should provide a clear and concise explanation of any key concepts, variables, or technical terms that use in the study that may be unfamiliar to the readers. So this can help the the readers have a common understanding of the terminology that you use and follow the logic of the study. And this definition should include any operational definitions of key variables or measures being used in the study to ensure consistency and clarity in the analysis. So when we say operational definitions, these are definitions about the words that are, there, there could be words that they meant different thing in your research. So that's what operational definition is. So what does this word means when it comes to this research? So say, for example, when I say uh, column, what does the word column means in this study, in this field? Uh, because column is different when it comes to uh, grammar. It's a different when it comes to engineering. So they have different connotation when it comes to the word column. So those are the major parts, uh, subparts of chapter one, the background of the study, statement of the problem, objectives of the study, significance of the study, scope and limitation of the study, and the definition of terms. So in writing the chapter one, you should really think of how you can put uh, context to the study and should focus also on answering the question why your study is important. Now we're moving on to chapter two, or the theoretical background and literature review. So for the chapter two, you can separate the theoretical background and also the literature review. So for the theoretical background, you should provide an overview 
of the theoretical frameworks, models, or concepts that underpin the study. Uh, for example, if it is educational research, what are the theories when it comes to learning that is involved in this research? Or for engineering, what are the theories in engineering that is relevant to this research? For example, the, if it, is it an, there is an application of a theory of relativity or electromagnetism or what? So you should mention the theoretical background that underpin the study. So this may also include a review of the uh, relevant literature and prior search research in the field, as well as discussion of any key theories or hypotheses that inform the research questions or problem that you are investigating. And your theoretical background should also explain how the study will contribute to the advancement of the theoretical understanding of the topic and also may suggest you uh, you should also suggest areas for future research based on the result of this part. On the other hand, the literature review is uh, it aims not to provide a comprehensive and critical overview of the existing research of the on the topic being studied. So this may include a summary of the key findings, methods, and limitations of prior research as well as any debates or controversies in the field. So the review should also identify any gaps or inconsistencies in the existing literature that the study seeks to address and explain how the study builds on or contributes to prior research. And finally, your literature review should highlight any methodological or theoretical approaches that is used in the prior research that are relevant to the current study. So it's really important that we, before we move on to the next part of our research, even in writing chapter one, we're already doing uh, a theoretical background and literature review for us to understand uh, the current state of the study on the topic and how we can move the topic forward. So the ideal output of chapter two should be the research gap or the literature gap on the topic. So this simply means that the things that the other researchers haven't investigated or haven't done or anything that, that they were not able to do because of the scope and limitations of the research or the methodology. So in chapter two, you should be able to identify those things and develop your own uh, research methods based on those uh, things that you found out in the literature review. So it's actually a very important part uh, of your research. Chapter three uh, includes the materials and uh, methods, in particular, the research design, the research flow, design conceptualization, the method of fabrication or simulation of programming, methods of testing and experimentation, the method of data collection, analysis, and optimization. So for the research design, uh, what a majority of the research now that I saw when it comes to the research design is that they don't mention the design of the study. So it's very important that you mention what is the design of your study. So the research design should outline the overall strategy and methods that you use to conduct the study. So this may include the description of the research approach. So you can mention whether it's a qualitative research design or a quantitative research design or whether it's a mix of a qualitative or a quantitative research design. So you should mention that. Now, what approach uh, are you using in this research? You should also include, if applicable, the sampling strategy, the data collection methods, and the data analysis techniques. So think of those things in writing the research design. And it should also uh, clearly link the research questions or problems that you are investigating you know, in order to design a study that could achieve the objectives of the study. And finally, your research design should address any potential sources of bias or limitations of the study and should also suggest strategies to mitigate these issues as you implement your research. 
The next part is the research flow. Uh, it's uh, referring to the research flow chart. So it's a visual representation of the steps or stages involved in conducting your study. So it should typically begin with defining the research problems and ends with the analysis and interpretation of the data. So this flowchart can help to provide a clear and organized overview of the research processes, including the sequence of, of tasks involved and any dependencies or feedback loops between the stages of your project. So it should also help to identify any potential bottlenecks or inefficiencies in the research process. And of course, you should be able to use this chart to suggest areas for optimization or improvement. The next part is the design conceptualization. So basically in engineering design, we follow the design conceptualization. So in this part, you just present you know, the process of developing your design. So what are the things that led to your design? So your design conceptualization is a critical step that should ensure that the study is well-planned, rigorous, and designed to achieve the objective of the research. The next part is the method of fabrication or simulation or programming. So in this method of fabrication, simulation, and programming, uh, you should specify the techniques and the tools that are used to create a test and analyze the study materials or the interventions that you use. So in the fabrication part, it just refers to the process of you creating the physical objects or materials. Well, the simulation involves using software to model or simulate the real world processes or the phenomena. And programming involves creating the software or code to automate the process or analyze the data. So you just simply use these methods, present them in your and how you, uh, what are the methods that you use or that you, what are the procedures involved in the fabrication, simulation, or programming. So the use of these methods will depend on the nature of the study. So there are times that one will not be applicable to you, two or three of them, these will not be applicable. So you just have to think which of this is also applicable or what your research is involved with. So you think, uh, before using any of this. So for example, in a study of a new medical device, a fabrication may involve designing and creating prototypes of the device. While simulation may involve modeling the device performance in different scenarios. Or in programming, uh, that device may be used to analyze the data collected from testing the device to automate data collection and analysis of the processes. So overall, the choice of the fabrication, simulation, and programming methods should be based on their suitability for the research questions and the resources available for your study. And then we have the method of testing and experimentation. So the method of testing and experimentation here refers to the procedures and protocols used to conduct the study test and or experiments. So this may include defining the study population, or sample, selecting appropriate measures or tests, and designing the procedures for administering the test or intervention. So additionally, the method of testing and experimentation may involve strategies for randomization, blinding or controlling potential confounding variables, and also the choice of testing and experimentation methods will depend also on your research question and also your study designs. For example, in a study that involves clinical trial of a new drug. So testing experimentation may involve randomizing participants to receive the drug or a placebo, measuring the outcomes over a defined period, and then collecting data on the adverse effects. Or in a study of a new teaching, me teaching method, testing and ex experimentation may involve comparing outcomes for students who received the new method to those who did not receive it, or to those who received traditional instruction using pre-test or post-test to measure learning outcomes. So overall, the testing and experimentation method should be designed to rigorously test the research questions and minimize the risk of bias or confounding factors. Finally, for the methods of data collection, analysis, and visualization, in chapter three, this refers to the procedures and tools 
that are used to collect, to process, and to analyze the data that the study generated. So this may involve selecting the appropriate data collection instruments no, for the data collection, as well as designing data collection protocols, ethics, which in, includes ensuring the protection of the rights, confidentiality, anonymity of the participants, and also collecting and um, storing the data in a manner that ensures accuracy and also confidentiality. So for the data analysis, this may involve selecting the appropriate statistical or computational methods, developing models to analyze the data and interpreting the results. And finally, for the visualization methods, you may use this to present the data in a clear and accessible way, such as through graphs, through charts, or other visual representation. So the choice of data collection, analysis, and visualization methods will depend also on the nature of the research questions and the data being collected by the studies. For example, in a study of a customer satisfaction, so data collection methods may include survey or interview, you know, while the data analysis may involve descriptive statistics or a regression analysis. Or in a study of genre expression patterns, data collection methods may involve high trough, trough food sequencing or micro array analysis, while data analysis may involve clustering or pathway analysis. So overall, the method of data collection, analysis, and visualization should be designed to answer the research questions and to provide meaningful insights into the phenomena being studied. So I hope that this uh, discussion on Chapter 3, Materials and Methods, help you in preparing the, the methods for your research. And then we have results and discussion. So the results and discussion here refers to the interpretation and the presentation of the data collected and analyzed in the study. So in chapter three, we discuss the methods, how we did that. But in chapter four, we just present the, the result. So results typically involve presenting the findings of the study in a clear and concise manner. You can use tables or graphs or visual aids. Remember your data visualization to communicate the results. So the discussion section should involve interpreting the results. So you're not just simply presenting the result, but interpreting the results, comparing these results to the existing literature, and identifying the implication of the findings in the results section. So the researcher should be able to summarize the data collected and present the key findings. So this may involve presenting the, statist the statistical summaries, the descriptive data or visual representations of the data. And in the discussion section, you may include the interpretation of the results and discuss the implication of these results, considering how your findings relate to existing literature and theory. So your discussion should also highlight any limitations of the study based on your scope and limitation and should also suggest the direction for the future research. So the results and discussion section is a critical part of your research study, as this one provide opportunity to communicate the findings to other researchers and also the stakeholders and to draw broader conclusions about the research questions. So the results and discussion section should be written clearly and concisely using appropriate language and terminology to ensure that the findings are communicated effectively. And finally, we're moving on to chapter five, the last chapter of a typical research paper, the summary, conclusion, and the recommendation. So these are the final components of your research study. You should provide the study's summary of the study's findings, the conclusion based on those findings, and recommendation for future research or for practice. So in the summary section, you will briefly recap the main findings of the study. You, know, you should highlight the key results and their implication. In the conclusion section, you will provide a more detailed discussion of the findings, drawing broader conclusions and discussing their implications for theory, for practice, or even for policy. And conclusion should also address any limitations of the study and should discuss the potential impact of the findings. And finally, the recommendation section should provide suggestion for future research or 
for practice based on the findings of the study. So this may involve identifying areas for fire investigation or suggesting practical application of the findings of your study. So your chapter 5 should provide you with the opportunity to synthesize the findings and to draw conclusions about those questions. It should be broader conclusions now. So this section of your paper should be written in a clear and also in a concise manner using appropriate language and terminology. And you should be able to communicate your summary conclusion recommendation effectively. So this is the typical component of your complete research project proposal. So when you're preparing for your project proposal, you can think of the preliminary pages, chapters one, chapters two, and you have chapter three. And you also include the bibliography, such as bill of materials, the Gantt chart, perhaps patent search report, if that involves invention, Ternitin report, and curriculum vitae of the researcher. So I suggest that before you start working on your complete research proposal, which is composed of chapters one to three, you have to make sure that your title is already. So I will be presenting also the format and the template that we will use for our research paper in the next topic. So I hope that you learned something from this video. You can share this out to your friends, to our colleague in the academy, if you think that this will also help them.